what we're going to the February 18th Davis City Council meeting. We're going to keep your eyes for a minute or so in the third and third meetings. Okay. Thank you. 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 Member Burns? Here. Member Brown? Here. Member Washington? Here. Member Brassley? Here. Member Allen? Here. Member Gifford? City Attorney? Here. We have a couple, three little things on the agenda for tonight, and then we're going to go into an executive session. Um, so, a couple of short meetings. First thing we're going to do tonight is the uh, second reading of 2014, number two, which is abandoning a portion of Brown Street. It's also identified as Harrison Avenue. City of Dayton, Kentucky, 2014, number two. An ordinance closing and abandoning a portion of Rowland Street, all site also identified as Harrison Avenue. This ordinance closes that portion of Rowland Street, also identified as Harrison Avenue, in Dayton, a voting property known as 41 Harrison Avenue, and that's the second reading. Okay, one question we adopt, uh, 2014 dash two. A second. Motion is made. Second, is there any other comments? Discussion? Good roll call, please. Member Brasky? Aye. Member Allen? Aye. Member Hurt? Aye. Member Brown? Aye. Member Holt? Aye. Okay. Next, we have the resolution 2014 4R, which is supporting the housing opportunities of Northern Kentucky. Okay. Um, before I read it, I just want to explain what this is. HEP, which is the housing opportunity. Communities of Northern Kentucky has purchased a home here in Dayton on Fifth Avenue. They're going to rehabilitate it and then put it back into the hands of a homeowner. Uh, the unique thing about HAC is that they work with low-income individuals, get them on the right track to home ownership. And a lot of times they start out as a lease-to-own program, and the individuals go into the home while they're getting their credit repaired or just getting prepared to own a home. Another thing they pay me while they're leasing it goes towards the cost of the home. Uh, many times I will say, Huck, they may spend $100,000 on a home and sell it to the individual for seventy-five dollars or less. They take a loss, but they're a nonprofit and they are committed to getting people into their homes. So, and what they want to do is use Homes Consortium dollars to help fund the part of this rehab, which this is the first. We finally got a project here in Dayton to use the uh, home development dollars from the Homes Consortium for, I guess since I've been on the board since its inception, uh, the home development dollars has ended up in Newport, so now it's our turn. <laughs> so, that being said, does anyone have any questions? It is 1316 Fifth Avenue. Okay. City of Dayton, Kentucky, 2014 for a resolution supporting the housing opportunities of Northern Kentucky Hunk project in Dayton and use of the Homes Consortium grant to help fund the project. Whereas the organization Housing Opportunities of Northern Kentucky Hunk is a charitable 501c3 organization improving housing stock for habitation by low-income families and has proposed a project to rehabilitate property at 1316 Fifth Avenue and whereas Hawk has proposed a project to rehabilitate property at 1316 Fifth Avenue in Dayton and whereas Hawk will require funding for a portion of the project from the Homes Consortium of Cities which include Dayton and whereas such a project will improve the quality of life in Dayton. Now, therefore, be it ordained by the City of Dayton, Campbell County, Kentucky, that Section 1, the City of Dayton, to Kentucky, declares its support for Hatch's project to rehabilitate the property known as 1316 Fifth Avenue in Dayton and declares its support for funding a sub-project from funds provided by the Homes Consortium of Cities, of which Dayton is a member. Section 2, the city hereby authorizes the mayor and any other city officer necessary to take all actions necessary to give effect to this order. Section 3, this order shall be signed by the mayor, attested by the city clerk, recorded, and shall be in effect at the earliest time provided by law. 
accept the motion to accept resolution number four, 2014. This isn't costing us anything. Yeah. Yeah. Just a gift. gift. Um, I'll make a motion we accept um, with, um, resolution right? mm -hmm. 2014 number four. Uh, I'll second it. Motion made the second during discussion. Uh, this, this cost nothing for the city of Dayton whatsoever. Right. Because several years ago, we joined in with Newport, Bellevue, and David and Covington. Ludlow. Ludlow and Brown, but they've dropped out since. Okay. And then what happens is Covington gets X amount of dollars from the federal government every year that they can use on housing. By us joining in with the Covington, it gives us a much greater pool of money to use. Covington still administers a grant. What we have to do is sign this resolution saying we support it. We give it to Covington, Covington votes on it, and then the money comes back to us daily. Yes. So it's a good deal. Any more call, please? Yes. Member Allen? Aye. Member Hart? Aye. Member Barnes? Aye. Member Bolton? Aye. Member Brooks? Aye. Okay. Moving on, I'd like to uh, introduce to you Mr. David Baker from Fawcett and Associates. He's going to be talking about our annual financial report. Um, the thing that's most important is the independent auditors report. It's the first thing we come to in the in the page there. And that's basically our opinion of your financial position. And if you look at the opinion paragraph, which is on the second page of the report, it says, in our opinion, the financial statements referred to above present fairly in all material respects. The respective financial position of the governmental activities, each major fund and aggregate remaining funds, information for the city of Dayton as of June 30, 2013, and the respective changes in financial position for the year they have ended in accordance with the accounting principles generally accepted in the United States of America. Now, that being said, do we want to get into, in, into this financial statement in depth here today? So we decided to have a meeting so that you can explain everything to us. And if anybody had any questions, this would be, be the time to ask. Uh, well, basically, if you look at the table of contents, let's start right there. Governmental financial statements are broken into some pieces. And, and to understand the financial statement as a whole, you have to understand the pieces. So we just talked about the auditor's report. The second thing in the, in the contents is the management discussion and analysis, and that's basically a letter from the mayor recapping everything that happened financially for the year. Um, and we look at those numbers and compare them to the financial state making sure everything is correct. Uh, that's a good read for council members to understand why things might be happening because there's some explanation in there. So um, it would be a recommendation for me for the council members to read that every year just so you get a feel for where things stand and why things happen the way they do. Um, then the financial statements themselves are what's next, and it, it, it breaks up into these three pieces. What we call the government-wide financial statements. That's a statement of net assets and a statement of activities. Now what these are is what's known in the for-profit business world as GAAP financial statements. These are generally accepted accounting principal financial statements, which includes all your fixed assets, and includes all your long-term debt, um, and it is for accrual of financial statements. It, it, more different than a regular for profit business prepares. Okay? Um, the reason why the Governmental Accounting Standards Board went to this format is because there's a lot of cities and a lot of government institutions that borrow money for banks and get bonds and literally people like got financial statements. So they brought GAAP financial statements into government of financial statements. The reality is, for this board, the GAAP financial statement is not the rigid rule that you live by, right? Because when we make debt payments, you have to account for that on a yearly basis as debt service. And when you buy capital assets, they don't just go on your balance sheet, but you have to write a check for them 
every year. So that brings us into the next set of financial statements, which are the fund financial statements. And these are the ones that are important to council. Okay? And they're, they're, they're a group of them. They go from page 11 to page uh, 14. Then you have a government balance sheet. You have a statement of revenues. And then you have a reconciliation that reconciles the fund statement to the gap statement. Okay? Uh, and, and those are the ones I really want to look at together. So let's start with the, the balance sheet on page 11. balance sheet, there's no fixed assets, there's nothing long term here. The government of funds uh, financial reporting is on a um, current resources basis. So what we want to do is we want to report on the resources that we have available to us. That's what the balance sheet shows us, is the resources that we have available to us and the liabilities that we might incur in the short term. Okay, so on the balance sheet, you have cash, you have some CDs, you have a little bit of accounts receivable where um, you've got unpaid property taxes and you've got some uh, payroll taxes that are receivable at the end of the year, that sort of thing. Um, you've got these notes receivable under the overall more fund, which you can see each of the major funds across the top of the balance sheet. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. And then under the liabilities, you have your current accounts payable, which are the people you owe on the short term. Accrued liabilities are things like payroll liabilities, um, uh, accrued vacation, things of that nature. Again, all short term current liabilities. And then uh, some deferred revenue. Now, deferred revenue is the holding account where we put receivables. Well, we're not going to collect in the next 60 days. So we can't consider them available to us currently. So we defer them to the next period. And the gap financial statements are recognized in this period. That's why there's a difference between the two. Okay? Um, that minimum, it, it, it doesn't mean that in the short term, and you guys have to always be thinking in the short term. Okay? And then we also have to show you debt service, where you're paying um, nothing. Nothing. <laughs> no debt. Uh, and then finally, you have uh, municipal aid as a reserved account. And what does that mean? That means that what that balance in municipal aid, that $383,000, has got to be used for what? That's Kentucky money that was given to the city for a road repair, that sort of thing. And it, it, it's always been reserved, and that's where it is. And then finally, you get to the unsigned uh, fund balances, which is your money that's free to use in each of these funds for whatever next step you go to. Now, what happens is, is that, that unsigned amount that is your beginning of your next budget. So that's your carry forward to the next year. And then you take your revenues and you take your planned expenses and you make your budget for the next year. So that's, uh, that's a good number for you guys. And then the next page um, is basically your income and expenses for the, for the year broken down by fund. And what I want you to pay particular attention to is both the revenue classes that you see, but more importantly, the expenditure classes that you see. You see, when we do expenditures at this level, it is by department. So your general revenue is your administrative, your police department is your police department, fire is a contract, public works is a department, Building services of the department, 
Waste collection is a department, and professional service is a department. Recreation is actually in a separate fund over there. Um, it's in the, the aggregate group. So when you budget every year, you're budgeting at the department level. But the city itself has financial statements at a much higher detail than this. You budget at a much higher detail than this. And it's important for this group to understand um, that when you guys do your budgeting work, that you're looking at that detail and understanding that that collapses down into these departments. So, um, you know what it is, taxes, license, you've got some integrated mentor. Integrated mentor is nothing more than the grants that you get every year. Um, charge for services is anything that you charge a permit fee for, uh, tickets, whatever. Okay. Um, then we've got low interest income, there's some miscellaneous income there. And then the other section that you want to look at, of course, is your debt service. Again, there's no debt service because you don't owe. And your capital outlay, which is basically the things you bought this year. And in the notes section, there's a detail showing what was purchased and what was added by department, that sort of thing. Okay? And then the next page is just basically what I said. It's a reconciliation. To reconcile the income statement from the fund statement to the gap statement of activities. And that just really explains to you the differences between the two statements that are there. So that's the second section, and that's an important section for council to pay attention to, is those fund financial statements. And then we have the notes, which are, which are good to read. I think you should understand them. They don't change a lot through the years, so it's, it's just basically says this is the procedures that we use, these are the policies that we maintain, and um, there's some little bit of detail about other fund transfers here. Um, then you have your detail on your depreciation uh, schedule on the things that you have in and deleted through for the year. Excuse me. The last piece that I really want you to focus on is the starts on page 23. And that is your budget to actual comparisons. This is called a required supplemental information in these financial statements. Uh, the says we're required to report on our budgeting versus actual, showing the differences. Um, it, this reporting method allows for two budgets, an original and an adjusted. You guys very rarely do the adjustment, but then you have the capability to do that. And uh, then it has the actual uh, revenues and expenses and the variance. And the variance that you see, a positive number means a positive variance. It was a good variance. If it's a negative number, it was a negative variance or a bad variance. So for example, if your revenue has a negative variance, that means you took in a lot less than you budgeted to take in. And in the expenses, it's exactly the opposite. If you have a negative variance in expenses, uh, you spent more than you budgeted this spend. So, um, that is a really quick brief overview of what these statements are and how they break down the pieces that they're into. Uh, the last report there is we are required to give you uh, not an opinion on your internal controls, but if we see deficiencies, we're required to report those deficiencies to you and the ones we see are in that report. Uh, the separation of duties deficiency is something that cities of this size have. Um, it's just sim a simple mathematical fact that you can afford to have enough staff to really do separation of duties the way it's meant to be done. Um, I, we, we always feel like you guys do a pretty good job of ch checks and balances and double checks, but you never never reach with the staff that you have, the 
separation of duties the way COSO intended it to be. So you would have almost always had that deficiency. Um, I, I had discussed with Kathy on What if we were to um, work with the college and was maybe have them provide an intern or someone who would come in quarterly and look at these uh, items that you've cited that we are deficiencies and they were to do like an audit as part of their curriculum and provide a report saying that everything is okay. Would that mitigate the Well, I don't think you can mitigate it because it's a simple fact that uh, the person who's collecting cash at the window is the same person who collects the deposit and balances the checkbook. And an intern might not help you with that. Well, I like the way the thought process is, and that is to get another set of eyes and another set of opinions on how our procedures are, and maybe they can come up think of something that might help uh, mitigate that. But I don't think you're going to ever, mm -hmm. without hiring more people, mm -hmm. make this problem go away. You're always going to have somebody between the obligation has been on vacation, or someone's going to be at launch, there's a lot of things the ideal situation is you would have a cashier sitting at that window doing nothing but collecting cash and recording it as a cashier and recording it, and somebody else would then count and close and balance that at the end of the day and record, make a deposit. But that same person who made that deposit wouldn't be able to open the bank statement and make us have a bank statement. Somebody else would have to do that. So you've got three people in a simple process of collecting cash and reconciling the bank statement. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Would you call that a significant deficiency? I mean, that's the maximum deficiency you can have, but there's not really can do the corrective. Uh, well, the maximum deficiency would be a material weakness. The significant deficiency to us, and, and if you read that, I think it kind of explains a significant deficiency in that report. The significant deficiency to us is something that needs to be brought to your attention. Uh, a material weakness is a weakness in internal controls that may cause a material misstatement that wouldn't get caught in the control process. And I don't think we see that here. Uh, we do see a few significant deficiencies, and I think it's just a function of the size, size. of the city. Okay. And the fact of the matter is the larger stuff doesn't, doesn't it's, uh, help everything, because we've seen that in the city of Covington. They didn't have check. They had checks and balances, supposedly, quote, quote, and they have a little, very large staff, and now they're hitting some financial. Well, you can't solve problems by throwing money at it. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, the, the, you, you do some things here that are good things. Um, you have double signings on your checks. You, you do a good job of matching the invoices with the checks, and it's all approved. Um, I just don't see any way around separation of duties without more people. I, I just want to give a compliment to, to the office staff, Don and the rest of them. They're doing, as you said, there's only two deficiencies in everything they do here. And so I compliment you, Donna, and the rest of the staff. Michael, you did a great job. You know, I think we talked earlier in the year about some training for the council members on budgeting and things of that nature. And I think those are important things. I think understanding the financial statements, not only at this level, but at the detailed level that you guys get on a regular basis, are real important to know where those numbers are coming from and why they are what they are. And I think it would be a good thing um, for this council to do as time goes by. Yeah. So, any financial statement questions, comments? Um, when you go back to page 23, section you know, 7, the liability thing to the liability thing to the liability party party. In that, you estimate your liability for the pending and department of labor lawsuits we have could affect us from anywhere from 85000 to 150000 But when you say that the city includes in that range 6600 for the payments that are made to our firefighters as a settlement, right? But you got to sell it. You said it, we paid that. Right. But we don't know what's happening at the state level with that and, and whether that can trickle back down to you guys or not. I think you guys are pretty convinced that that problem is settled. 
but there's still a risk of that building. We don't, we don't have it built. We're just putting in the footnotes to say that it is a possibility. That possibility exists that if the lawsuit that's going on with that situation ever comes to light here, you could have some background abilities that you think you have settled at this point, and you settled it for 6,600. But we don't want to just leave it unknown until that is completely resolved through the state and the legislature and all that mess. Okay. A, a, a number of these are kind of specific, so you yes. may not be able to remember them if you we have to look it up and the whole idea is what that is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, on page five, you say that the uh, operating grants and contributions, no, I'm sorry. Um, you said that the professional fees uh, expenses increase because the grant target expended expenses are offset by fees collected from the residents. What are those fees? Do you remember what those fees are that we pay? Professional fees for the grant part? Well, that's tax, where you probably. Yeah, that's where you have them, but it's the, uh, to redo the street. We can pay, wasn't that where they pay uh, residents to fund them? Right. Yes. But you have that budgeted in, in professional fees, and we can talk to the staff about that as well. Maybe in general expenses, or I mean general government. I think maybe another category altogether when you're putting together your budget. That would be more appropriate. And you had said something too. You said that we had said. Page five is management discussion. This is this is this is kids work. Page 16, you talk about the investments that the city is permitted to put their money in. I just want to note that even though the statute allows that, allows investment in those six or seven areas, we have a, a policy that uh, is a little less uh, expansive. Isn't that right, Donna? Uh, have you ever seen that? It's a, an order or resolution that was adopted by the city. Ooh. And it just says that, I, I think what it says is we can only invest in uh, investments that are uh, supported by the full faith and credit of the year. Well, what this says is these are, the, these are the investment opportunities that are authorized by the state statute. It's not saying that that's what you use. I just want to make